Um, I'm Kevin Anderson. I'm Professor of Energy and Climate Change um, at the University of Manchester, and I've worked um, on climate issues for about 30 years. But prior to that, actually, I did spend 10 years working in the petrochemical industry as a design engineer for on offshore oil and gas platforms. Um, I'm going to start just with a little bit of political background first and just remind ourselves what we've committed to. And in November, the Glasgow COP26, the Taoiseach made a very clear statement that unless we act now, we will not keep the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees alive. As political leaders, it is our responsibility um, to put the necessary policies in place, and Ireland is ready to play its part. So that's, if you like, a context of the commitment that Ireland has made, and indeed, of course, something very similar for all wealthy countries. I then want to just provide a little bit of flavour of the sort of quantitative background against which, within which I think it's important to consider um, when developing analysis for Ireland. But if you look at Ireland's emissions, and if you consider we've had the global banking crisis and indeed the COVID pan pandemic, Ireland's emissions in 2020 are the same as they were in 1990. And in fact, if you factor in a slight increase in aviation and shipping emissions, they're higher. You factor in the rise in emissions of agriculture, they're higher again. So Ireland has fundamentally failed to reduce its emissions since 1990. Ireland has territorial emissions of carbon dioxide per capita that are around 17% higher than the, than the average for the EU27. A typical Irish citizen has a total carbon footprint 27% higher than the Chinese citizen, 75% above, above the global norm, and 10 times that for a typical um, African person. Ireland's GDP per capita measured in, in purchasing power parity it puts it at the third, third world's richest nation. It has a PPP per capita value that is over twice that for the average EU person, more than five times the global average, and 16 times that of a typical African. The population of, den of density of Ireland is very low, about 70 people per square kilometre. That's about, um, well, it's considerably lower than the EU, for instance. It has a very long coastline, extremely favourable wind regime and high tidal ranges. Overall, uh, Ireland is disproportionately well served for developing renewable energy. So against that background, and then carried out the, uh, the analysis that I submitted, so it's, and it's, which is more detailed in the text that I've sent you, but I'm going to summarise that now. First, I want to make clear that my analysis takes the Taoiseach's and Ireland's commitments towards 1.5, particularly 1.5 now, but also 2 degrees centigrade at face value. Um, my analysis is based on the science and the numbers. I eschew political sensibilities, legal niceties, and I'm not constrained by some ephemeral tenets of the current economic status quo. So all that gets parked, and I do the analysis based on the commitments, the numbers, and the science. I focus here on energy, which is the, the area of, 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 my, of my expertise, energy use and supply. I recognise that agricultural emissions, particularly for Ireland and other countries such as New Zealand, is, is particularly important. So uh, agricultural emissions are a key part of understanding how much space we have for energy. So they're not my area of expertise. Other people have spoken about those, but they are key. I'm going to be focusing here on energy and the carbon budgets only. And I'm using the numbers based, the carbon budgets based on IPCC AR6. So the latest set of data we have from the IPCC. And I'm using two budgets, two headline budgets for the submission I made to this hearing. One is for, to simplify it, is that one is for a good chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, and the other is for a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade of warming. The details are, are in the text. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, pointing out here that there is a huge difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Both of these are disastrous for many people. But what, you know, one, well, at 2 degrees centigrade, the impacts are considerably greater than they are at 1.5. And they will be felt initially by poor and climate vulnerable communities around the world, typically low emitters and typically people of colour. But they will also, of course, be felt within a decade or so by our own children and by our own grandchildren. So then I then updated the AR6 budgets, which are from 2020 to 2022, which is obviously where we are now. Um, and I estimate from that simple bit of arithmetic using the latest emissions, the global carbon budget we have now is about 270 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per 1.5 degrees centigrade, good chance of it and about 680 billion tonnes, much less onerous for a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade. But I take Ireland's um, being a signatory 
to the UNFCCC, repeatedly um, international protocols since the UNFCCC uh, in, um, inception in 1992, and the whole concept of common but differentiated responsibility at face value. I assume that Ireland was being honest when it said it wanted to give uh, some emission, additional emission space for the development of poorer parts of the world. If you do that, then the repercussions for the wealthy parts of the world, Ireland included, of course, in that, are severe. If you take that, take that into account, then the carbon budget for Ireland from now to the start of 2022 across this century is about 120 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, 120 million tonnes of carbon dioxide for a good chance of 1.5 to about 300 million tonnes for a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade. Just think of some of the numbers you heard earlier, 120 to 300 million tonnes. This covers, say, 2022 to, to the end of the century, is for all energy carbon dioxide, including aviation and shipping. If you don't want to include aviation and shipping, you have to take an additional amount of that budget away. Now, if an island was to carry on at its current level of emissions, which is roughly, from an energy point of view, is roughly 33 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, plus, as, uh, as, as Barry pointed out earlier, about 4 million tonnes or so of aviation and shipping on top of that, then that's somewhere between three and eight years of current emissions before you exceed the fair budget for Ireland for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Three to eight years of current emissions. And Ireland shows no sign of its emissions coming down at the moment. If, in fact, you drew a straight line from today, say after this meeting you go away, you implement policies immediately, and there's a straight line to zero emissions, that means Ireland has to be zero emissions by 2029 for 1.5, good chance of 1.5, and 2038 for a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade. Another way of thinking of that is looking at the reduction rates. If you were to start now at a set reduction rate, for 1.5 degrees centigrade, you have to reduce emissions at about 30% every single year. Sounds impossible. Should have started in 1990. We've failed for 30 years. For 2 degrees centigrade, the rate is much lower, about 12% per annum. But remember, that includes aviation and shipping. And all of this, of course, does require fundamental change in, in the agricultural practices um, it, within Ireland and in the, you know, the, the current dietary requirements towards um, beef and dairy. There is no easy way out of this dilemma that rich countries are now facing and that we have got ourselves into. We are precisely here because for 30 years we've been unprepared to face the climate challenge with honesty and integrity. And that brings us to the point we are now, because physics doesn't care about our political niceties. It only cares about molecules of greenhouse gas emissions. And wealthy, choices, wealthy nations have a choice now whether to succeed or fail, but that depends on this idea of honesty and integrity. This analysis is different to some others you will hear, principally for two reasons. One is that virtually all other analysis relies on future generations removing huge quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere using carbon dioxide removal techniques and technologies that are highly speculative. There are a few pilot schemes, most of them in the imagination of, of academics still. And yet we're relying on these in virtually all analysis. We're passing the burden to future generations to suck our carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I would argue that is irresponsible and it passes a huge burden on the future generations in terms of the risks of much larger levels of climate impacts. So whilst we should research those technologies and deploy them if they meet stringent sustainability criteria, we should not rely on them, which we are currently in all of our analysis because we want to make something that's more politically palatable. The second part is we are completely ignoring our, our, um, our commitments on international equity. Even under the, in the in scenarios I'm showing you, the cumulative emissions per person a year are still greater for rich countries than they are for poor countries. There is no fair way of dividing the budget anymore. There's just the least unfair way of doing it. So even this disproportionately affects the poor parts of the world. They're the two reasons my analysis is different, because it doesn't have any political expediency in here. So in summary, Ireland is an extremely wealthy nation with a highly educated population and very favourable renewable energy potential. Moreover, it has a low population density and it should be citing renewable supply um, with ease because it's, you know, it's very unproblematic for Ireland compared with most other nations. Despite Ireland's unique financial and geographical position, I mean, incredibly wealthy, of course, 
to lead the world in renewable energy development, according to its own Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, only 11% of its gross energy consumption is actually renewable. That means, put it more simply, 90% of Ireland's in 2022, or 2020 where this data is from, 90% of Ireland's total energy consumption is unsustainable. Ireland's failure to deliver any reduction in net emissions since 1990, and that's worth reiterating. Ireland's failure to produce any net reduction in emissions since 1990, despite its favourable financial position and geography, suggests thus far that climate change has received no serious political attention. The unprecedented carbon budget challenges Ireland faces today stems in part from its own choice to essentially ignore three decades of clear scientific analysis and advice. Each year, this failure to heed the science continu continues, so the mitigation challenges will increase. Ultimately, the physics of climate change will always beat any ephemeral economics or indeed political niceties that ignores, uh, uh, that ignores it, that ignores the physics. The sub subsequent climate impacts we are knowingly bequeathing to Ireland's own future and to more vulnerable communities elsewhere today. We have to remember the real world behind this is about impacts and people are living with the impacts of Ireland's choices and indeed the UK's choices today. And we are passing that burden on to our own children. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Anderson, for your statement. We will move on to questions now. A number of members have indicated to 